forethought in the people who designed EXT3 and probably 4 at this point in time that they made it backwardsly compatible. You can take a journal operating system, a dish that's formatted with EXT3, mount it as EXT2, use all the same tools that have been around for forever for data recovery or carving or anything else with EXT2 tools. So when you're looking for something for even like well, you know Windows or cross-system compatibility, that's what most of the tools are actually going to say because there's not too many actual data recovery programs that are specifically for Linux that's for EXT2 or 3 or Riser. But uh, so in some cases, if you lost a file or you deleted something and you need to go looking for it and you just don't want to do file carving, you are looking for EXT2 tools. Uh, so I think it's really cool that we have that functionality and that we can just take a step back just changing how we mount it and physically see that content. But uh, at least from a standpoint of Mac OS, when Mac OS uh, added HFS support, they had HFS Plus and they added journaling support, they didn't have so much forethought from that standpoint, I guess. Uh, so the, they did finally go, oh, what happens to those people who don't have you know, Plus support? Because now we're talking about primarily people since 2002, 2001. They added journaling support in OS X 2001, 2002. Uh, so fairly recently by comparison, and, uh, of course, Macs weren't extremely popular in 2002, so there probably wasn't a lot of people posting much about that. But So what they did was when you mount an, an HFS Plus system, a hard drive, on an older system, it comes up with this little window, a little box, and it says, where have all of my files gone? <laughs> I am not kidding. That's what it said. That's what the box does. There's a little thing that says, where have all of my files gone? Now, if you want to see people have heart attacks, <laughs> this is an awesome way to do it. This is the, I mean, can you imagine tomorrow if, uh, and I don't know what they're going to do for ZFS because, you know, there's a lot of talk about it being supported, and will, I will love it if they do because HFS is not the best from a robust standpoint. I can, I can kill HFS pretty quickly. Uh, it's a binary tree. All you got to do is whack something in the middle of the tree, and pff, it doesn't get the rest of it, just so you know. But, uh, so anyway, so that's what it said. Where have all my files gone? And then this is what was in the file, basically. It's like, well, we have them hostage, and you can upgrade for, you know, X dollar. You know, got to go to this. Well, you know. Anyway, so they did add it, and they did have some patches and some updates for 8.1 and stuff. So you had the ability to do that. But I just kind of thought that was cool. Can you imagine if that happened today? That would really be a shocker. Like, uh, talk about hitting the newspaper and stuff. And All right. <clears throat> I've got things to give away here, so I guess I got to come up with something. Maybe I just say, who's going to guess what my number four is? No, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> All right, mace time. How many people do forensics? Okay, and everybody knows what Mac time is. Who doesn't know what? I, no one's going to raise their hand for that one. Uh, okay. Okay. So you have modified access and created times on your computer, right? So you basically, when forensics people are looking for stuff, that's a fairly vital component. And uh, just kind of like a little tidbit, most people don't know that by default in Vista, they turned off access times. Access times is equal to the uh, modified time. So it's kind of the, the operating system was so slow that they couldn't make it work or something, and somebody <laughs> discovered it and turned it. <laughs> somebody discovered it and turned it off. <laughs> is Crispin here? Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> so anyway, so Windows systems, they have a MFT. And in the MFT, there's all this undocumented stuff. There's all these records and content and updates and things that exist. And so in there, there is a uh, MFT entry modified. And what this means is, uh, and it's special for forensics people, basically, uh, and it's very difficult in some cases to get this content out. When it was discovered, it was, uh, there wasn't very many tools that you could actually figure this out with unless you were using a hex editor. Um, but from this standpoint, what it means is when you have a file and it grows, you, paste, you, know, you open up a Word document, you paste something in, and it grows beyond the cluster that the, the file sits in. It takes up two clusters instead of one cluster. There is a time, a date stamp, that is stuck in the MFT entry, and you can tell when this file was larger or smaller. So if you opened it up and you deleted everything out of it, the time would shrink. <clears throat> you would actually get a, a time when the, when the cluster shrank. And there is a lot of other content that a lot of people don't know about because there's a lot of things that are undocumented. So that there's, uh, there's even like when you rename a file, 
There's actually a date and timestamp that's actually stored in a record for when you renamed the file. It has its own creation times for those kind of things. But, uh, but this MACE time has been fairly well documented in NCASE and FTK and a couple other things use it. But uh, it is great if you're trying to track some changes on a machine and somebody's trying to fool you, somebody's trying to figure something out. But your Windows machine is tracking that time when it actually changed. There is a guy who says, okay, great. Well, let's write this program called Time Stomp. And Time Stomp goes and actually fills some of that content with fake bogus information so that it messes up forensics people. So if you want to get the other side of that, that's what you do. You, you use Time Stomp and it kills those dates and times. So, uh, and one of the reasons that I included this is that uh, a, someone wrote a Perl script, basically. And you can find this Perl script. And if you just do a search for NTFS-MBR, together, you'll find the code out there online. And there's a link down there at the bottom. But uh, for all of you that want to use Linux to analyze a Windows machine and see that, there's somebody who wrote this uh, Perl script that basically will run through and spit out that modified time of whenever that entry was made or changed. Anybody use this? Anybody use mace time? Anybody in forensics actually go back and look at that? Nobody talks about it? No one's going to admit it? For a book, anybody admit? <laughs> Liar. <laughs> okay, for your new forensics job. Oh, cool. Guy, I was getting a new job. What's that? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so here's just this is just kind of a cool thing that I think is pretty neat that most, most people don't put any thought into. Um, anybody in here old enough to remember when you had to part the heads of your hard drive? Yeah. <laughs> Man, we got So the young crowd didn't come. They don't care about hard drives. It's all solid state now. We don't need anything. So, <laughs> so, uh, so basically, the, the major problem we have, and there's a lot of things with, this, uh, with the hard drive itself, and you know, when they came up with this idea about how to park the heads, it was, it was great. It was amazing. You know, now when we go to move our, our old IBM AT, we, uh, we don't have to park our heads anymore because we have this new hard drive. If we switch from MFM to something else. <clears throat> See, nobody remembers that. <laughs> RLL. RLL, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that didn't last long. Well... <laughs> anyway, uh, so anyway, so the whole point is, is there was a lot of thought that actually went into parking the heads and all the content with regards to the heads. Because uh, how many people know what stiction is? Yeah. So, what is stiction? Okay. Right. And there was a problem with we had a stiction problem. Does anybody remember what what actually happened? To, yeah. Yes, right. That's exactly right. You pound it on the desk or on an AT machine. You would walk up and you know somebody go, oh, it didn't come on. I can't get that. You go, mm, you know, and you whack it on the side. <clears throat> and the other thing people did was they, so that, you know, that was so they didn't have to disassemble the machine. But if that didn't work, they had to take the hard drive out and they had to create torque, just like just like this man here says. He's basically you take torque, you put it on the table, and you spin it. That's how you do it, and it creates torque and breaks free. The head would stick to the platter. The platter is a very, very smooth surface. So basically, whenever you've got two really smooth surfaces, they will stick together and they will not come apart unless you have enough g-forces to do that. In some cases, the g-force required or the torque that was required would rip the head off. <laughs> <coughs> so some of us, that was the last time we saw that drive. <laughs> uh, it didn't work, and you spun it, and you hit it, and you did whatever. And so, what's that? <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, right. So, uh, <laughs> this is from O'Reilly, and he is the art of application. All right. So, so here's the here's the really cool thing about the whole process, though, that I didn't realize. A lot of people go, "Oh, well, they just 
park it in the middle and put some lubrication and that solved the problem and we have a place to put it so they just go to park position. Uh, but there's a lot of forethought that went into not only how the head was